can influence others to change their minds, to popular business and marketing books about influencing employees or influencing customers. But largely unexamined in this sort of like robust history of thinking about influence are the ways in which it is an industrial construction. So now, in an era when influence has become a commodity, cultivated by individuals, uh, quantified by, by companies, and leveraged for material benefit online, uh, understanding these dynamics is important, is my argument at least. <laughs> um, so this latest incarnation of influence is distilled most visibly, of course, on social media's influencer economy, which is the multi-billion dollar industry wherein individuals earn income uh, by posting authentic personality inflected content to strategically cultivated audiences and earning income by collaborating with, uh, with advertisers. This ecosystem is comprised of marketers and analytics companies, advertisers, individual social media users, and social media companies. And their ideas about what influence is, how it works, and why it matters uh, manifested in their various quantifying, ranking, and commodifying activities uh, increasingly help to define what it means for a person or a cultural product to be successful. For example, how many times was this fashion label's Instagram image sh shared? Um, and they, and they can determine whether um, or not something will be successful at all. For example, does this person have enough Twitter followers to be a, a viable book author? Other uh, examples of the pervasiveness of this influence economy logic uh, abound from colleges that now offer courses in cultivating influential personal brands to, of course, a president and a candidate whose Twitter reach became, or was used as evidence as fitness for office. So how did this industrialization of influence happen? I'm gonna go back to some of these early ideas I mentioned um, and kind of trace them up to the factors um, that in recent years have sort of accelerated this uh, development of the influence industry. So fundamental to thinking about influence is a concern about authority and social power. Who has it, how is it deployed, uh, and what are the consequences? Long before influence became like the buzzword that it is today, um, some thinkers set the stage for how we understand what it is now. Uh, Max Weber, for example, pointed to the role uh, of authenticity in the process, even though he didn't use the word authenticity. Uh, but he observed that uh, authority figures, or cultural authority figures, um, always reject as undignified, I'm quoting here, any pecuniary gain that is methodical and rational. And they prove themselves not by expertise or training, oh, end quote, I should say, <laughs> my paraphrasing, they prove themselves not by expertise or training, but by their ability to follow through on claims that they make about themselves. So the notion of authenticity is really evergreen in discourses surrounding influence and authority. Um, even while in recent years, authenticity has kind of become an overused and so somewhat muddled concept. Um, in the 1910s and 1920s, for example, authenticity captured the popular imagination uh, as a way to gain personal fulfillment and influence over others. Uh, media historian Jefferson Pooley has pointed out that a number of writers in this, era, in this era described that peculiar contradiction that was becoming core to American culture, which is, quote, be, be true to yourself, it's to your strategic advantage. Around the same time, government and media institutions began to understand that they could leverage authentic messages and new mass media technologies that were new at the time uh, to try to enact influence on a broad scale. Uh, so in his controversial, controversial book, uh, The Man Nobody Knows, which was published in 1925, uh, advertising titan and agency founder Bruce Barton cautioned that the public has a sixth sense for detecting insincerity. They know it instinctively when words ring too. True. At the same time, George Creel, who was the head of the U.S. government's first organized propaganda outfit, uh, wrote that his committee's work was successful in large part because of its authentic nature. 
quote, our effort was educational and informative throughout, he wrote, the simple, straightforward presentation of facts, end quote. But notably, it was also, I'm quoting it, a vast enterprise in salesmanship, the world's greatest adventure in advertising. So Edward Bernays' landmark work, Propaganda, uh, was published in 1928 and kind of summed up and, and rationalized the ways in which influence had become increasingly organized at mass scale. And he penned this famous passage that many of you might be familiar with, uh, which is the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manip manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes are formed, and our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. It is they who pull the wires that control the public mind. So as such adulation for the power of and the questionable need for organized persuasion campaigns uh, became mainstream. Questions about how people are or are not influenced uh, began to captivate researchers. Um, so changing times also upped the urgency of these research efforts. We had Nazi propaganda as well as things like uh, you know the War of the Worlds broadcasts. Um, that seemed to indicate to people that messages could be metaphorically shot into the minds of audiences um, and get them to act in certain ways. So psychologists and sociologists got to work looking for how people's minds and behaviors could be influenced. Um, in the 1950s, uh, Elihu Katz and Paul Lazarsfeld came up with the idea of two-step flow, which is the idea that certain people act as opinion leaders or, or influentials and filter information to their friends and neighbors, and p other people's interactions with these people drive some behavior and opinion formation. And so the impact of this particular work on understandings of influence was tremendous, shaping the very way we still talk about it. Um, and social researchers and social observers of all stripes really ran with this idea that certain people, and we're not just talking about celebrities or spokespeople, but people that we know, regular people, uh, are influential. And a wealth of writing has sprung up in the decades since about how to identify influentials how, or how to become one, um, and goals that really became especially appealing with the rise of personal branding. So by the mid to late 2000s, a number of factors that had kind of been brewing for some time came together, really helping to sort of give rise to this influence industry that we now uh, experience. So first we had technological factors like the growth of uh, blogging platforms like WordPress and social media platforms, uh, which made the process of sharing information and building an audience for yourself obviously much easier than it had ever been. Uh, cultural things, uh, like for example, these well, these technological changes allowed people to have uh, direct lines to publics that they'd never had before, and they, it dovetailed nicely with this cultural valorization of personal branding, entrepreneurialism, and celebrity uh, that had been growing for some time, as well as the increasingly individualized nature of work. Um, economic factors, obviously millions of people lost jobs in the wake of the global financial crisis, um, and many under or unemployed people took to uh, social media platforms um, to communicate their expertise and explore other interests. And then industrial factors um, related to the media industry. So at the same time, advertisers are looking for more effective outlets um, than print media, and they found blogs and later individuals' feeds um, on social media platforms um, like Instagram, ideal. These were the influencers that these business books um, and popular discourse and academic research have been pointing to. These people are authentic, they're real, and of course their influence is easily measured. So money poured into this space uh, as advertisers sought to leverage people as channels for commercial messages online, and marketers and analytics companies and social media companies all tried to figure out how they could benefit from this. So like we've seen over and over again with social media is this burgeoning industry was hailed as totally new and open to everybody. 
uh, in 2012, one marketing expert optimistically asserted that, quote, in this new world of social influence, even the obscure, the shy, and the overlooked can become celebrities in their slice of the online world. You too can earn your way into the influence class. While social media have surely enabled new meanings and uses of influence, uh, these ideas and that of other contemporary writers on influence uh, reflect persistent themes in the historical trajectory of influence as a concept. That it can be quantified, uh, that certain people are more influential than others, that you have to be real, uh, and that technology makes this whole thing democratic have all been championed at different times. And these ideas continue to guide social media's influencer economy whose stakeholders, uh, the marketers, tech companies, and influencers that I mentioned earlier, um, are helping to build agendas for public discourse and for consumer culture. So social media influencers have helped to construct a new environment for the way people interact with information and cultural products. Uh, influencers are a means of sorting information. They're easily digestible personal brands, signal what type of content they provide, um, and more recent technological development has allowed them to offer uh, seamless integration with, of content with the ability to shop. And in a post-ad world, uh, influencers offer companies a crucial means of getting messages to the public. Uh, so while they typically identify their work as a creative outlet, uh, they have become critical to the marketing and retail systems. So as social media uh, continue to evolve and change the nature and content of online information, influence as a quantified product made meaningful by the advertisers and marketers who have co-opted academic theories uh, has become a critical form of social and economic capital. It spills out to shape cultural production more broadly. Uh, I've been conducting interviews for a few years with people involved in the influence industry, and I've found a few ways this happens, which I just want to put out there um, and then I'll wrap up. <laughs> no, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first, of course, related to labor, which I mentioned at the beginning, influence is being used as a proxy for worthiness and somewhat arbitrarily at that. Um, and I can get into that more in the Q&A if, if people would like to in, uh, talk about it. Um, and of course, those who are dubbed worthy typically adhere to certain aesthetics and beyond that with products themselves, like engagement and this quantifiable influence online um, sort of reaps more of the same. My research looks mostly at the fashion and lifestyle space and we see countless examples uh, of this, um, Instagrammable things being prioritized and things like that. Um, and then finally, when we think about self-presentation itself, there's a, there has to be sort of an aesthetic discipline, willingness to monetize yourself and your followers in order to participate in this influence industry. Um, and I'll just end it there, and hopefully, and we can discuss this more in Q&A if anyone would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Emily, and I would love to come back on uh, yeah. many of those points in the Q&A. Um, we have our next presenter who's already getting ready, Grayson Earl. He's a visiting professor at the New York City College of Technology, and he's also a co-creator of Fail Block and a core member of the Illuminator Art Collective. Great, thank you. Uh, and I really appreciate your introduction before uh, you know, the uh, uh, the entirety of our, our talks. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be speaking about is coming from a place of uh, what I see as a need for a robust and decisive uh, anti-racist intersectional socialist movement in the United States and abroad, uh, considering recent events. Um, <clears throat> so I spent the last year or so creating, co-creating Bail Block with my collaborators, which I want to name uh, Maya Binyam, Francis Sang, J.B. Rabinovitz, Sam Levine, Devin Kenny, and many members of the Dark Inquiry Collective, uh, which was born out of the context of the New Inquiry. Um, <clears throat> it was inspired in part by the 1989 SETI at Home project, uh -huh. um, which allowed volunteers to download an application that would enlist latent computing power uh, in their home computers to create an ad hoc supercomputer. So raw data is received from the SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence satellite array, uh, sent out to a network of volunteers, crunched using their SETI at home software, and then returned to Berkeley researchers in a parsable format for their own research. Uh, 
the initiative, uh, the initiative was, among other things, a means of creating resources out of thin air, and effectively a supercomputer. Um, in 2010, while overseeing a computer lab at my university, which I will not name, uh, I learned about Bitcoin. Uh, I didn't, and still don't particularly endorse it as a financial system, uh, but I was intrigued by the prospect of circumventing the need for banks um, with the use of a distributed network of participants. As it turned out, mining, which will be uh, covered in some depth uh, uh, in some of the next uh, presentations, uh, was one crucial aspect of Bitcoin that made it possible. Uh, suffice to say for now that mining is an opt-in level of participation in a cryptocurrency uh, that involves contributing compute power to verify transactions on the network. Uh, the process is incentivized such that miners are given random but dependable rewards of the cryptocurrency in question. Uh, this is the mechanism that replaces labor of the bank apparatus and its uh, workers. So my curiosity was piqued at this point, learning about Bitcoin and the mining process. And as many Bitcoin stories go, I installed some mining software on the um, computers at the university, um, somewhat surreptitiously. Uh, I didn't take it too, uh, that seriously and ran the experiment for maybe two weeks or so while no one was using the computer lab. Um, and this was back in 2010, so I think the value of Bitcoin was something like um, $10. So when I generated two Bitcoin without very much effort, I kind of shrugged it off and moved on to other endeavors. Um, of course, today that's worth something like twenty thousand um, dollars. But I, you know, I sort of spent it, lost it, uh, whatever along the way. Um, uh, but it always stuck in my mind as an interesting experiment because I was able to generate financial resources out of thin air, as I like to think of it. Of course, uh, there are some things taken for granted in there, like. Uh, computing power and energy and this kind of thing. Um, so after the election of Donald Trump, the need to divorce from traditional modes of clicktivism was made extremely apparent. Um, and I wondered about generating financial resources for the impending resistance movement. I hit upon the idea of distributed mining as a means of creating these resources, though it wasn't until linking up with a new inquiry that we were able to formulate a full politics around the project and orient orient it specifically towards paying bail for marginalized people in New York City. Um, there are a number of reasons for this decision, uh, that being bail, uh, including the revolving bail model, which is such that uh, if you meet the, uh, the standards of your bail as set forth by a judge, the money is returned to the person who posts the bail. Um, so in this way, if we can accumulate some resources using this model, the money can be used over and over and over again. So, with the average bail at about $900 in New York City, $1,000 could theoretically bail out an infinite number of people. Um, there's also the rhetorical potential of a project like this to transform public opinion around bail, uh, to shift the argument a bit, uh, and the lofty goal of encouraging the justice system to collapse under its own weight. In Nick Pinto's New York Times op-ed, The Bail Trap, he outlined the basic assumptions of our justice system, which is that more than 90% of people are expected to not take, uh, take their cases to trial when convicted of a crime. Um, often because they, can not, they can't afford bail, and a guilty plea deal is preferable to spending time in jail awaiting trial. Remember, none of these people have been convicted of a crime yet. Um, if twice as many people could make bail, which is still less than 15% of all people, um, there wouldn't be enough judges or courtrooms in the country to hear the amount of cases. Um, so if you provide more people with the means of paying bail, you can implode the justice system, which hopefully would lead to a change in policing. Um, so we created a bail block. Um, it works a lot like SETI at home. Participants can download an application that runs in the background of everyday computer use. Uh, it's actually running right now on this computer. <laughs> um, a coordinated mining pool gives each machine running bail block a list of transactions to solve, and as reward blocks are found, um, the bail block Monero wallet receives fractions of Monero coin. So Monero as a, a coin that works a bit like Bitcoin. Um, this is the stats page of the application, by the way. Uh, we then trade the Monero for US dollars and cut a check for the entire amount generated to our partners at the Bronx Freedom Fund, who have agreed to spend the money exclusively on bail rather than administrative costs. 
On Christmas Day, after five weeks of the project running, we cut a check for $3,333.77, which is just a lucky coincidence. <laughs> uh, the project continues to generate money to pay bail, raising over $7,000 to date uh, through this set it and forget it style downloadable application. Uh, while this isn't a particularly impressive number, per se, um, the fact is that the more people that use the program, the more effective it will become, and it will just sort of continue to do its thing uh, over time. Um, more importantly, the project is also greater than the sum of its parts, or as I like to say, the sum of its hash rate. Um, it's as much about catapulting a radical criticism of bail into the public imagination as it is about raising bail funds via cryptocurrency. The project also seeks to engage people in a dialogue about the fact that the justice system takes as a basic assumption that poor people will not be able to afford bail. Bail block is one tool among many to support the very long-standing movement for abolition. Um, in thinking beyond bail block to other leftist interventions on cryptocurrency, my concerns are with some of the prevailing assumptions of its largely libertarian community. Bitcoin is, a, is primarily viewed as a speculative asset for a class of people already possessing relatively high levels of capital, and furthermore as a tool for frictionless capitalism. It is already undermining the economy of Venezuela, for example, a situation which is typically lauded on Bitcoin message boards. Perhaps Bitcoin is presently a good investment for some of these citizens suffering from a difficult economy, uh, but what chance does the state have to correct its financial system in this case? And furthermore, what will happen to an increasing number of people who have become reliant on an emergent global financial system that is essentially a wild experiment? Over the course of developing Bailblock, I've become increasingly interested in some of the non-speculative dimensions of cryptocurrency that might address some of these questions that I have. Uh, Bailblock, after all, doesn't really engage with the full medium of cryptocurrency. Um, like, like Ethereum does, for example, which expands the possibilities of the blockchain considerably. So rather than the ledger, like in Bitcoin, in the case of Bitcoin, rather than the ledger just being simply a list of all the transactions that have occurred, um, something like a smart contract system can expand this to take in conditional logic and uh, programming languages that are inscribed into the ledger itself. Um, if capital flow is the primary concern of an incipient techno-libertarian class, what would a technologically engaged socialist intervention on the technology look like? What sorts of smart contracts would an international workers' party write? Could we end the wage gap? Could we pay reparations? Why is it that this is not a basic assumption of this new financial system? Uh, visit any cryptocurrency meetup, like I went to the Ethereal Summit uh, last year, um, and the demographics are imminently clear. <laughs> they are a sea of white men, like myself. Um, we make up the majority of attendees at crypto conferences, and it begs the question, how revolutionary can this new financial system be if it benefits the same cast of characters? Uh, I think of Elon Musk's consistent warnings of AI taking over the world, <laughs> motivating him to call for regulations on the technology and I think whenever a staunch capitalist calls for regulations, there's something strange going on. Um, I think that his fears are really quite simple. He's afraid that an organized technology will subjugate him in the same way that he and other members of the advanced capitalist class already subjugate workers. Uh, it's important to remember that we already live under algorithmic principles. Capitalism is an algorithmic principle. Uh, to be a capitalist is to proclaim with extreme particularity the way in which labor is administered and compensated. To that end, there are a few existing projects that seek to enable worker ownership and environmental justice. Doma City is a project that I find particularly interesting that essentially pays uh, renters in tokens that represent collective ownership of a network of properties. So, great. Um, when you pay rent, you receive tokens and you come to own a property. It's a bit like a mortgage, except that uh, it's fluid and you can apply this to living in any city that has a Doma um, structure set up. Um, and instead of giving thousands of dollars to the landowning class, workers gain a steady control over their city. Uh, or Terra Zero, which gifts a smart contract system to a forest. Uh, the contract sells off portions of the forest at a sustainable rate to logging companies, and over time it buys itself off in perpetuity. Um, so I think that uh, if we are at the precipice of an entirely new financial system, which we may be, uh, it's crucial for leftists to intervene now, at this moment, uh, at this early stage. Uh, rather than reject technology and cryptocurrency-based smart contracts, workers should organize to write the code that will comprise 
the economic ethics of our future economy. Thanks. Our next presenter will also be talking about cryptocurrency. Uh, Nina Poehler, uh, from Bitcoin's anarcho-capitalism to the commons of, this, of smart cash, political philosophy in cryptocurrency governance. Nina Poehler is a PhD candidate in sociology at Humboldt Universität Berlin. Her PhD project is on governance and coordination in alternative organizations. She works as a research assistant um, and a programmer at the City Science Lab at Haven City University in Hamburg. Thank you for the introduction, Anna. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, governance and cryptocurrencies and also how political philosophical ideas play a role in governance there. And I will use two examples of cryptocurrencies, the original Bitcoin and Smart Cash, which is an alternative cryptocurrency um, to illustrate this. And so one idea of this talk is that um, you can think of ideas of good governance and also actual um, governance mechanisms as um, you can localize them in a political philosophical spectrum where on one end you have anarcho-capitalism and on the other hand you have a commons perspective. And here you see a very simplified outline of these approaches. Um, what both have in common is um, that they value um, individual autonomy and decentralization. But apart from that, they are actually quite different. So some of the main differences is that in anarcho-capitalism, the idea of society is without a state and people interact on a free market with each other, uh, while uh, commons are resources that are governed neither by a state nor by market laws, but by rules and institutions that have been designed by community for this community. And while in anarcho-capitalism, the basic idea of, of the actors or the people is that they are all independent, isolated individuals who can't trust each other, um, in a commons perspective, individuals are seen as socially embedded and they can create trust and meaningful relations. And so um, then the basic um, interaction between people in an anarcho-capitalist perspective is one where you have voluntary transactions on a free market. Uh, while in commons, the main interaction, the most important, is that of collective self-governance of common resources. So this is about this is just a background for the next. Um, a cryptocurrency. Um, what is a cryptocurrency? Um, this is a quote from the Bitcoin white paper. Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash that allows payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. And Bitcoin was released in um, 2009, um, and it was the first uh, decentralized cryptocurrency that was actually working. However, this idea of a cryptocurrency had been around since the 1990s, and it emerged in the cypherpunk uh, community. Um, they had like this mailing list that was set up also in the 1990s, and people on this mailing list um, were interested in how cryptography would make uh, anonymous private communication and transactions possible. And they were interested in this because they wanted to create this space which was free of government control and um, oppression. And the main innovation um, in Bitcoin that made this cypherpunk dream of a cryptocurrency possible um, was the blockchain. And um, a blockchain um, has like the basic elements are transactions and a certain amount of transactions is stored into a block and the block is then chained to the blocks that have been there before. And here you can see the Bitcoin network and what you can see um, is that this is a network that is decentralized and peer-to-peer -peer. and everyone on this network, they have their own copy of the blockchain. So the blockchain is then um, a decentralized database that keeps track of all the transactions that have been happening in this network. And you basically have two different actors in this network. You have the nodes and the users, and you have the miners. And unfortunately, because there's not enough time, I won't talk much about mining, but um, so the mining thing is that miners, they create new blocks. And in Bitcoin, uh, this means that they have to use uh, a lot of energy and they are rewarded with block rewards, which is at the moment 12.5 Bitcoin per block. <coughs> 
And um, if you think about what you know about the blockchain so far, um, it makes sense to say that um, the blockchain can actually uh, be seen as a commons, by which I mean that it is a resource that is commonly shared and reproduced uh, by a group of people, and it is neither private property nor is it governed or owned or regulated by a state. Um, however, um, cryptocurrencies are usually not governed like commons, and I will now talk about the governance aspects. So first of all, you can say that uh, if you think about cryptocurrencies and governance, uh, it's important to not only look at the blockchain <coughs> level, where you have like the protocol, you also have to look at the uh, levels above. And this is um, a differ differentiation that is based on Eleanor Ostrom's work on governing the commons, mm -hmm. where you have like three levels of governance. Um, the highest level, uh, you can think of it as the constitutional level, uh, it defines uh, who decides how decisions are made. And then you have the middle level, you can think of it as the legislative level, uh, which defines how decisions can be made. And then on the lowest level, you have the blockchain protocol, which are the rules that make up the network implemented in code. And um, because most cryptocurrencies are open source software projects, this means that on the highest level, you have the developers of the code, mm -hmm. and they will change the code according to established <coughs> practices of open source software development, like peer review. And then, um, and the miners and the nodes who uh, maintain and produce the blockchain, they are confined to the lowest level of governance and they don't have any direct influence um, on the higher levels. And so um, in this initial original version of Bitcoin, we have a really awkward mixture of different um, governance mechanisms and also political philosophical ideas because um, on the lowest level, you have like this space where you have independent individuals uh, doing anonymous transactions. So you have like this anarcho-capitalist idea. But in the middle level, we have the more commons-oriented practices of open source software development. And then on the highest level, we have the benevolent programmer dictator, which was Satoshi uh, Nakamoto in the beginning. And um, when Bitcoin became um, bigger and more popular, um, and in the last years um, specifically, it was clear that this is not the best governance structure, uh, especially uh, for two of the most uh, important areas of decision making for cryptocurrencies. And these are um, how, to maintain, uh, how to maintain and finance blockchain infrastructure, and on the other hand, how to make decisions according to code changes. And um, so Bitcoin is not the only cryptocurrency, there are a lot of alternative cryptocurrencies and some of them have interesting governance features where they try to come up with solutions to these two problems. And one of them is Smart Cash. And uh, among other things, they have um, developed a system to finance the blockchain infrastructure, uh, which is different from Bitcoin. Um, so Smart Cash, um, they uh, describe themselves as focused on community governance and cooperation. And the main thing that sets them apart is uh, how they um, distribute the block rewards. So uh, in Bitcoin, here down, uh, miners get 100% of the block reward, whereas um, in Smart Cash it's only 5%. And then 70% um, are used uh, one hand to pay the developers, um, the outreach team and the web team. And then approximately 50% is used for a community fund. This community fund is uh, used to finance uh, projects that have some kind of value for smart cash. And everyone who has a, an idea for a project and can pay 100 smart can make a proposal. And then everyone who has smart can vote, one smart is one vote. And if you get a majority of the votes, um, your proposal will be funded. Um, so what is interesting here is that Smart Cash, they have this governance system that takes into account that the blockchain is a common resource. And they found a way to uh, finance the development and the maintenance of this common resource for the profit that is earned with it. And I will now talk about the second area of decision. And here I will talk about uh, Bitcoin again. Um, so the second problem of a cryptocurrency where they have to find a governance structure to deal with it is what do we do when we want to change the code? How do we decide on that? 
And um, so I will talk about a moment in the history of Bitcoin where there was a conflict over code changes. Um, but before I talk about this, you have to understand one more thing about Bitcoin. And this is that, um, so the developers, they can change the code, but they actually need the people on the network to update their software um, so that the code is actually working in the network. And if the developers change the rules for creating the blocks, they need a majority of the miners to update the software. Because if not, um, then what happens is that the network creates different versions of the blockchain. And as soon as you have different versions of the blockchain, your transactions are not secure anymore. Um, so in Bitcoin, they have this nice way of um, coming up with a solution to this, which is that miners, with every block that they mine, they can set a signal that they are ready for um, an upgrade of the software. And as soon as you have a majority of the miners signaling, um, <coughs> the update gets activated. And this is important to understand a part of the block size debate that I'm going to talk about. And Okay, I have to be fast. So um, the block size uh, debate, this is really only a part of it. There's actually more to it. The part that I'm talking about happened in 2017. And it's about um, scaling the network and making it faster. And so it starts with a proposal, the SegWit proposal, which uh, basically would allow more transactions in one block. And the developers and the users in the Bitcoin community like this proposal. The miners and the businesses like this proposal as well, but they want an additional block size increase. And there is then a controversy because the developers and the users, the majority of them, they don't want this block size increase, and then there's a conflict. And one of the reactions is that the miners delay uh, the activation of SegWit, and they do this by just not signaling that they're ready for this uh, update. Then, um, there's like uh, a proposal from one of the developers for the user activated soft fork, which is a way to force the miners to update um, their software. Uh, and it works like this. You have like all the nodes and they update their code and then they promise with this update that they will not accept any blocks that are mined by miners who are not signaling for SegWit. So what then happens is these blocks don't get on their blockchain, um, but the uh, blocks of the miners who are uh, ready for the update, they get accepted. And what then happens over time is that you have two different versions of the blockchain in the network, but if the users have like the majority, their chain will be longer. And in Bitcoin, there's this rule that the longest chain always wins. And so this would then actually mean that the miners that have not been signaling for SegWit, they use all their block rewards. Um, so this never happened, they never had to do this, um, because in the end, uh, miners just, the majority signaled that they were ready for SegWit and it got activated. And so one thing that happened in this block size debate is um, the meaning of miner signaling changed. It used to be uh, just a thing that you would do so that there was a um, more efficient transition to the new software, but now it is a political act. Um, the other thing that changed is that all of these anonymous independent users, they found a way to become a collective actor with political power. And if you think about the governance levels that I've talked about before, uh, what they also did in the block size debate is that they essentially claimed their space on top of uh, the governance. And to um, sum this up a bit, uh, public blockchains are common resources and therefore cryptocurrency governance can be, should be a governance of the commons and Cryptocurrency governance is influenced by a number of factors, among them political philosophical ideas, uh, but then also logics of open source development, network effects, and the possibility of uh, making um, different versions of the blockchain, and of course profit maximization and speculative capital. Thank you. Thank you. Did you do those drawings yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, that merits an extra time. Um, our next presenter, um, Sinan Liu, she will present the life of Bucky Barnes slash fandom on social media. Sinan Liu is an MA candidate in instructional technology and media at Columbus University. <laughs> 
the Columbia University. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Thank you, Anna. And don't worry, I'll try to make sure that we finish on time. Um, so today I want to talk about slash fandom on social media uh, with the case study of an Instagram account called The Life of Bucky Barnes just to show how social media platforms can facilitate and transform this online subculture community and which is actually attracting more and more attention now. Um, so just very quickly some background information slash portrays a romantic relationship between two same-sex characters, mostly male, from a variety of media sources like books, televisions, films, games, and here are some fan arts from the popular slash fandoms that you might recognize some of them. Um, so apart from the paintings that I just showed, fans, they participate in this slash fandom by creating other kinds of fan works like fan fictions, Photoshop images, fan videos, and cosplays, etc. And this all date back to the 1970s, the Star Trek fandom, where the Kirk Spock are believed to be the first popular slash pair. And this phenomenon has been attracting attention from the academics and since the 1970s. Well, the 1990s, we have seen a large volume of literature uh, focusing on fan culture, slash studies, participatory culture, and especially Henry Jenkins, you basically can't read or write an article about fan culture without quoting from him. Um, so in this case study, uh, we are going to analyze the Instagram account called The Life of Bucky Barnes. It posts fun arts featuring this fictional character called Bucky Barnes, aka the Winter Soldier, and his romantic relationship with Steve Rogers, aka Captain America. Those two are from the are characters from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So in the films, they're just close friends, but in this world, they are lovers. You know, those kind who sleep together. And on the right is the example of the fan art posted on this Instagram, Instagram account. So the adoption of social media actually opened up these new possibilities for communication and participation for a much larger fan base compared to a traditional offline fan group or a specialized online fan forum. And under this account, fans, also this account particularly provides fans a very immersive experience as if their very fictional character himself was posting on his personal Instagram account. So under this account, fans, they play different roles. We have the creator, we have active users, they like, repost, comment, translate, and we have lurkers. You can't really see them, but they're out there more than you can imagine. And there are a list of other roles that they play. So fans, this interaction between all these participants, they form a constant exchange of knowledge and is constantly creating new meanings surrounding the original media context. So the artist behind this account is actually French, but composing English make her fan arts more accessible to a more international fan base. Uh, followers in the comment section mostly comment on uh, in English, but sometimes there are like comments in other languages too. Actually, her fine art is very interesting. Uh, the fine arts on this account actually being reposted on some major Chinese social media sites, because Tumblr and Instagram are actually blocked in China, so they don't really have access to this. So. Uh, but this is actually give, uh, give us this very rare opportunity to observe uh, this consumption of Western media in a non-Western, non-English speaking uh, context. <laughs> so, uh, for example, on Weibo, that's like the biggest Chinese social media site. You can imagine it as like a combination of Twitter and Instagram. So influencers with thousands of followers, they would post uh, or repost uh, fan arts from this Instagram account. However, their selection of fan arts, as you can see on the top right, 
um, they kind of try to reduce these homoerotic aspects. They try to select those with like single character of a group character instead of the romantic relationship between these two. Um, however, the individual um, slash fans, they do not really make this distinction. I mean, they love those ones with homoerotic aspects, and also they are reposting, translating, commenting, discussing like every other uh, fans across the world. But they, but they are in this very unique social cultural structure that decides that they are a very isolated subculture group. Um, I mean, still far away from the mainstream because the LGBT movement is still. Uh, very marginalized in the Chinese society. So back to the Insta Instagram account. So in, uh, I think last year in June, this fandom actually exploded because the actor who played this character, Rakim Barnes, uh, Sebastian Stan, he himself commented and liked one of the posts on this account. So everyone was like, wow, he knows us. So I mean, of course he knows. So <laughs> Sebastian Stan, he is uh, listed as Tumblr's most popular, most reblogged actor for like a few years from now. I mean, he's not really a list star, but um, but like many connected his popularity with this booming fandom slash fandom between like Bucky and Steve, and people started calling him like the Tumblr's boyfriend. And he knows the Marvel Studio knows the the uh, I think the film director of the of Captain America actually calls these relation between the two actors a love story in interviews like all the time. So this kind of using it as a new marketing strategy, they try to exploit this intense feelings in slash fandoms because they are one of the most intensely dedicated section of these online fan communities. But some but some people also question them as like queer baby because they are just like teasing the fans, they have no intention to actually realizing it in the original films. <clears throat> but however, um, the productivity, the thriving productivity and the digital presence kind of um, earn their fandom some kind of crit critic leverage with the in the, uh, industry producers. So this is like one of the many examples how new media technologies have profoundly altered the relation between audience and media producers. Um, in the same year, uh, well, I, I think that's also 2016, uh, after three Captain American films, a hashtag called Give Captain America a Boyfriend started trending on social medias, generating like thousands of posts. Of course, it's still almost impossible to see this homoerotic fantasy to be officially endorsed by this blockbuster family targeting franchise. And especially in countries like China, the whole LGBTQ thing is still completely excluded from media. So Slash is kind of one of the most important ways for girls, well, mostly girls, uh, to participate, access, understand this part of the society. And with the LGBTQ movement, with advocation for representation, queerness, maybe one day this slash fantasy can become canon. Like canon is a fandom word for the official setting of the media, of the original media. So the slash fandom on social media, they are of all can be setting up new opportunities for opening up, for um, adding included, uh, calling for inclusiveness of queerness as for uh, media representation. Thank you. I mean, we can just leave that slide up. And, uh, <laughs> come on, I invite you all back here, please. Again, a one round of applause for all the fabulous people. Mm -hmm. So, um, any questions uh, in the room? Hi. 
Hi. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone. It's uh, been fascinating to hear about your respective work. Um, my question is for Emily. Hello. <laughs> um, and I came in a little bit late, so I apologize if this is something that you talked about, but in, in thinking about the industrialization of influence, I'm wondering if you've um, spent any time thinking about, because I'm also trying to think about, um, the integration of machine learning into um, the field of um, influencer marketing, um, and you know some of the interesting experiments in automating social media influencers, like creating these sort of um, completely fabricated personas, um, and how that sort of works into some of your research. I wish I had a better answer for you <laughs> other than I have thought about it, but, I, but um, the the whole thing of like the whole completely fabricated personality, like um, oh, now I'm forgetting who's the one that is in Los Angeles. You probably know. Lola Kayla. Yes, Lola Kayla. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I don't know because you don't know Lola Kayla is like an avatar on Instagram who somehow I don't know how they do it, but they like put her in real settings like with like posing with her arm around people and you know like she could be up here with us you know whatever and it looks very realistic um but anyway she's like an influencer but she's not real but she acts like she's real and um yeah so anyway all this to say i this is something that i've just started like looking at in the last like six weeks so unfortunately i don't have like a good answer for you other than um I have started asking about it when I interview people, um, and it seems like, especially people who work um, at brands and also at sort of like industry observers, like people, who, trend forecasters and people like that, um, are very excited, but also weirded out by this, <laughs> but excited about it, and, it, and seem to think that this is like the direction that influencers are going. Um, but yeah, I would love to talk to you more about it. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have a question for you, Emily. Um, and I was just thinking about how in some situations it's pretty clear that somebody has a job as a social media influencer, like they work for a company and that's what they do. But people who are, are, we could almost say, freelancing as a social media influencer, do you think that they should be legally required to disclose that they are paid to make posts in some way? Like, if they have a Instagram, have that in a bio. Mm -hmm. Like, not necessarily who is paying them, but mm -hmm. that they get paid. Yeah, I think it's important that the um, that there is disclosure when something is a paid for post, and that's becoming more and more the norm, especially in the last like year or two with um, you know the FTC putting a lot of influencers on notice that they're violating um, you know regulations, and also they're trying to come up with you know new regulations and get on top of what's going on um, because that was certainly a problem. Um, and it, it, I mean, it still is a problem, but it's getting a little bit better with um, with the regulations. People are being more upfront and doing like hash. There, a lot of times, it's required now to do like hashtag ad in the caption of the post, visibly, not doing like the like space 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 down, like burying it. Um, and so it is becoming more apparent, and I hope that it will continue to become. Um, more clear when something is an ad. And a lot of, it, I should say that most influencers are sort of like freelance, as you say. Like they're, it's, I'm, I'm not really aware of anyone who necessarily has like a job with a particular company, but they're all sort of like taking deals with various brands. And so, and some people put in their bios, yeah, I'm an influencer, but mostly it comes up like a post for post, like this is an ad, this isn't. And um, I, I think it's moving in the, the right direction, disclosure-wise, and I, and I hope to see more of it because I think it is, um, you know, it's a problem. Thank you. Another question over here. Okay, thank you all so much. It's really informative for someone who knows nothing about blockchain, so I love <coughs> all these different technologies and uses. My question's for Grayson and also for Nina. Um, both of you talked about how democratic and how innovative blockchain and cryptocurrency could be for communities and how there's like really great philosophies that underlie the technologies. But Grace, you mentioned how it mostly benefits and 
was the population the age of cryptocurrency are white and male. So I was wondering if either of both of you had suggestions as to how we could incorporate marginalized communities. <laughs> Well, I, I, I would not say that I, I talked about that uh, it's like inherently or even that it could be like, I think the way that Bitcoin works with the proof of work um, consensus mechanism, which I couldn't talk about, I don't think it's ever going to be democratic. But I mean, there are other things like there's, for instance, Faircoin. Um, they are based in like uh, Spain and um, the Basque country and they have a different way of setting up the blockchain and um, I'm not sure how much I can go into detail this, but the thing is that many of the cryptocurrencies, they have this idea that they want to offer a payment system for people who can't get any bank account, or they want to do the thing that many local currencies are already doing or have been doing in history, where they want to uh, strengthen local economies. And I think this is possible also through um, a cryptocurrency. I'm not sure if it's always necessary, but it is possible. Um, I mean, it's a really good question about how do you how do you go about doing that, actually gaining participation from people uh, who have been sort of systematically, you know, kept out of finance, from capitalism, and the economy. Um, I mean, one way is, I mean, yeah, because part of that is like who has the technical literacy to like even like have a computer to like get online or whatever. Part of my what I'm trying to do, I think, is uh, at least. Uh, as a stopgap for that, like when you know people at like the ethereal summit get up on stage or, or like give presentations about how progressive their idea is and how they're going to like bank the unbanked, all this stuff. Say, okay, well that's cool. Put your money where your mouth is. Like, how about you know the Ethereum network uh, doesn't process transactions until uh, certain conditions are met, or like let's actually embed uh, political philosophies into this system as a smart contract. Uh, um, so that's the kind of thing that I would like to see the discussion move forward is like, okay, uh, you say you're you know the progressive answer, well let's let's actually like codify that very explicitly. So these uh, uh, blockchain based cryptocurrencies <coughs> tend to rely on this notion of proof of work. The problem with work is it requires energy, and the problem with energy is that most of it comes from fossil fuels. Is this an inherent problem, or is there some way of getting around this? Um, well, there is there is a way around it, uh, in or at least like that uh, does a lot <laughs> to address that problem. <clears throat> Going from proof of work, which is cryptocurrency mining, to proof of stake, uh, for example, which is like rather than this kind of like randomized reward system, whoever can stake, you know, enough currency, like in, I don't know, I have 60 Ethereum, so I'm staking that, and then I'll be selected as someone who's going to verify the next transaction on the network. Um, this has social implications, like who has the capital to stake that. Um, and so another thing that could be interesting is like investment cooperatives for people uh, to band together to participate in that kind of a thing. Um, but I also personally think it's important to remember that. We, you know, every single form of work costs energy, um, and you know, uh, anytime you're participating in a Facebook argument or uh, really doing anything uh, online of any kind, you're, you know, using uh, energy. Um, so I think it's important to keep that in mind. I mean, clearly with Bitcoin mining, there's this huge problem, uh, but uh, yeah, many forms of of uh, labor require that kind of energy. And um, to add to this, so I talked about Faircoin before, and I can maybe talk more about that, because they have uh, a different version of proof of stake, which they call proof of cooperation. And w so what they do is like, they know someone, and so this person with their server, they can, they can um, vouch for the new blocks, so they don't need energy or anything. And so they will then um, broaden the network by whoever knows someone else can bring them into the network and then they have like a distributed network of these nodes that can actually um, um, legitimately say that these blocks are okay. Um, however, the thing with uh, proof of cooperation and proof of stake is like everything that is so cool about the original idea of the blockchain, um, the whole um, 
thing that is that is really elegant that you don't need anything else and it's trustless all of this is then gone so and then the, the question is maybe something that we have seen before like democratic banks or people that get together to have funds is maybe more efficient mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Any questions for the last presentations? Because I do have one and I want to make sure that we hear from everyone. Uh, Sinan, thank you uh, for uh, this fa fascinating case study uh, that I was not aware of. Um, you mentioned how uh, those creative um, and uh, creative processes and, and outputs have also been co-opted in a certain way by the big studios, but uh, without following up uh, in, a, in a more uh, specific way. Could you say more about that? Because that's a recurring theme, right? Is that we have this thing which appears new, there could be some new power uh, uh, redistribution, but it ends up all being the same. And maybe it's not in the technology, maybe it's somewhere else, or is it? And I would love uh, to hear more about that. So for now, the cooperate from the producers mostly <laughs> exists in the marketing part instead of the actually uh, producing part. But that's why there are like criticism, like queer baiting, and like the, in the fandoms, they uh, they would sometimes protest if they the producers go too like way beyond. Uh, if they're like really implying there's some sort of implications without actually doing things. But I think they are still restricted. I, I mean the producers, they are like still restricted by this big commercial uh, environment because they have to think about uh, uh, like there are some, there are like parents who don't want their kids to see stuff. Uh, media contents with this theme. So I guess with like a general social progress, um, this they can probably be less tense about this, and we can see more cooperation from their side in the future. Yeah. Thank you. you had a question before. Mm -hmm. oh. Is that you still have a question? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is for Emily, and um, I was. Uh, having this discussion, <laughs> um, I was having this discussion also with Victoria, who asked the first question um, after her talk about her research, um, discussing this, um, uh, the 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 fact that um, this influencer economy is is predicated on the assumption of authentic presentation of. Um, your opinions or whatever um, and have been trying to understand like ethically what that implies when you have we're already at a point when um, it's questionable obviously not all posts can be tagged with an ad um, optimistically it they are but not completely and then you have situations with like Lil Michaela or whatever which is the like fabrication of um, what would be considered an authentic. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So, like, what will happen, it, like, to this uh, understanding of authenticity when you do have like the complete fabrication of um, like characters who are not real who can give this like authentic endorsement? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out because it's interesting, like you said, like, sure, if so, if someone has, um, you know, they have explicitly made a deal with a brand and they put up an Instagram post and they put ad, great. But the rest of the time, even if they aren't in partnership with a brand, there's still, a, there's this awareness that brands might be looking at me I this is my presence is monetizable so even when I'm posting stuff that's just like hey a picture of me you know walking down the street or whatever I still need to you know be constructing this authentic personality that is something that brands want to work with um, or that I can can make money off of in the future so yeah, I um, I don't, <laughs> sorry to say this again, but I don't have an answer for that yet. Um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what is happening to authenticity. My, 
my early sort of answer is that authenticity, you know, is losing as its sort of meaning as we can all probably guess, and it's kind of o obvious, and it's turning into just like what is believable as something that someone could potentially be doing. Do I believe this? Rather than like, is it really authentic to who they are? I do believe we have time for one more question. <laughs> so, one more question, any? Thank you. Thank you again for, thanks everyone to, for presenting. Uh, questions to Emily as well. So. For some context, during the day I work in the industry okay. that sees the influencer marketing thing as just a business activity, but at night I work in food, which has a love-hate relationship with food influencers, right? So I think in one way we could look at this very cynically and say influencers um, get us to do things that aren't necessarily good for society. Think of all the people who like put food on the floor so they could Instagram it better, or restaurants <laughs> that build food just so that it looks good, right. right? But we also know that there could be some good out of it, so chefs or farmers who have good questions are finally having a platform to influence people into doing good things. If we were to move in that positive direction, do you think the onus is on us as a user, meaning we shouldn't go down the street and do things because we know we could become an influencer? Or do you think the onus is on tech, meaning we need to come up with better incentives so that people aren't using tech in that way? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I could talk about this all day, we should talk about it. Uh, but yeah, what's, I mean, it's worth noting that the technology platforms like build in these sort of incentives for us to behave in this way. And so um, my first answer is yes, it, we need to hold like tech, the, you know, tech companies and social media platforms and things like that accountable for the ways in which they try to cite us to use the platforms in certain ways. Um, but that being said, um, I, I'm not, you know, going to say like it's all tech's fault. There's like this sort of, there are a lot of other factors um, that I kind of brought up in my uh, talk that are at, that are contributing to this environment, you know, the broader economic circumstances um, wherein people are, um, you know, it, it, wherein work is becoming more precarious and people are looking for other ways to make money or to practice their skills um, that they have. And so we need to take a look at the bigger picture, uh, but I think a good first step is, um, you know, looking at the tech and how we might be able to um, change it in ways that are maybe like more conducive to other uses. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This was about Zunina's uh, question of governance, right? If it weren't applied to the blockchain. I don't know if you want to chime in on what Emily just said. Um, sure. I mean, I think you've pointed in the direction of platform cooperativism and decentralized internet, and we need more of that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great, uh, and it's like, how do you say that in, in English? It's a great word for the end that we can keep in mind and take out there and make work. So thank you again for being here, for engaging.